Welcome to Kombucha Chem Academy. Our purpose here is to put a scientific spin on our understanding of kombucha and kombucha brewing. So the topic of today's talk is going to be carbonation of kombucha, whether it be natural carbonation or forced carbonation of the beverage. So first off, why would we want to carbonate kombucha? Well, as it turns out, having those little bubbles of carbon dioxide in the kombucha adds considerably both to the overall flavor of the beverage and also to the mouthfeel. I know personally, I prefer to have some of that bubbly goodness in my kombucha when I enjoy it. So let's first start talking about the various um, variables that are important when we carbonate kombucha, specifically in this case, more along the lines of um, forced carbonation. So the two important variables that we have to consider here are going to be pressure and temperature, both of which are represented in this graph here. So what we're plotting here is the solubility of carbon dioxide in our kombucha um, as a function of temperature here and pressure on these two curves. Now what we see first is if we see an increase in pressure from 15 psi, for example, up to 30 psi, that's a doubling of the pressure of the um, carbon dioxide gas above the kombucha, we see that any given temperature, for example, at 25 degrees Celsius here, we see essentially a doubling of the solubility of the carbon dioxide in the beverage. Now, let's take a look at the temperature dependence here. If we look at this um, 15 psi curve here, the green curve, what we'll notice is if we decrease the temperature from 25 degrees Celsius, basically room temperature, down to 4 degrees Celsius, which is refrigeration temperature, we see that we also get an increase in the solubility of the carbon dioxide in the beverage. So essentially what this tells us is that if we increase the pressure of the gas above the liquid, we get an increase in solubility. Also, if we decrease the temperature, we also get an increase in gas solubility, but to a lesser extent here. So really what we want to do is we want to focus in on those two variables. So again, the two important variables we need to consider are going to be pressure and temperature. Now again, when we talk about carbon dioxide solubility, what are we really talking about here? Well, this is a concentration. So when we talk about concentration in chemical terms, what we're really thinking about is the number of carbon dioxide molecules that I can force into a given volume of kombucha. That's essentially what our carbon dioxide solubility here is a measurement of, all right? And um, this solubility, as I mentioned, is gonna be a function of the pressure of the carbon dioxide gas above the kombucha, as well as the temperature. So let's just um, visualize this here. So it's always good to have a nice little visual here. So here's a closed system like a kombucha keg. Now, what we have in the keg here is going to be our liquid. So this would presumably be our kombucha here. And above the liquid, we have a gaseous headspace here. I also show some ports on the keg so we can bring carbon dioxide in externally um, into the headspace. And we can also have, for example, a blow-off valve or an exit valve here so that we can uh, get rid of some of the carbon dioxide if we need to as well. But generally speaking, we want to consider this to be a closed system that we're dealing with. All right, so considering our closed container here with our gaseous headspace above it that we just discussed, let's talk about those temperature and pressure variables and why our kombucha behaves the way it does in terms of gas solubility. So I want to start by talking about the pressure variable first. Okay, so as we noted, if we increase the pressure of the um, carbon dioxide above the kombucha, we increase the gas solubility of the carbon dioxide in the kombucha. All right, the best way to understand this um, is by way of something called Henry's Law here. And what Henry's Law tells us is exactly what the graph tells us. It tells us that the solubility of the gas is proportional directly to the pressure of the gas above the solution. Okay, so in other words, what this is telling me is if I double the pressure of the gas above the solution, I'm essentially going to double the solubility of the gas in the solution. That's Henry's Law. Now, why does Henry's Law work? We like to have a little bit of a model for these kinds of things. So let's think about what we've got above the headspace. So here in the headspace, above the liquid, I've got some carbon dioxide molecules 
far apart from each other in the gas phase. Now think about what happens if I increase the pressure. Now if I'm increasing the pressure, I remain at a fixed volume of headspace here, but what I'm really doing is greatly increasing the number of carbon dioxide molecules which are going to reside in that headspace. So I'm going to add a whole bunch more carbon dioxide molecules here in our picture. Now, the other thing that we have to recognize here is that these carbon dioxide molecules are moving. So they're moving randomly throughout that headspace. So you can imagine a situation based on random motion where maybe one of these CO2 molecules is going to encounter the interface between the gas and the liquid. And when it does that, it essentially gets absorbed into the liquid and solubilized. All right. So here's the deal. If we greatly increase the population of carbon dioxide molecules in our headspace, which are moving randomly around, we get a much higher probability of any one of those carbon dioxide molecules interacting with the liquid phase and essentially being integrated into it. Okay, so that's essentially our model for Henry's law. So next, what we'd like to discuss are the finer points of the temperature dependence that we just discussed. So just a very quick review here. We notice that at any given pressure, if we decrease the temperature, we get an increase in carbon, di carbon dioxide solubility. So what this really says is that the solubility of the gas is going to increase as the temperature of the solution decreases. All right, so let's see if we can make some sense out of this. Now, the first thing that we have to understand is that when we change the temperature of a system, essentially what we're doing is we're changing the amount of heat or energy in that system. So a change in temperature results in a change in energy, and we can think of energy as heat. Okay, So if we're removing heat from a system, we're causing the temperature of that system to go down, for example. Okay, So that's the interrelation between um, heat and temperature. Now, let's think about this from a slightly different angle. And this is another one that I think kombucha brewers are gonna be familiar with. I could ask you the question, if you wanted to increase the solubility of sugar in your tea, how would you do it? And chances are you would tell me that you're gonna get a higher solubility of sugar in tea if you heat the tea up. And that would make perfect sense. So what that tells me essentially is that, um, if we increase the um, temperature of a system, we can increase the solubility of a solid like sugar in that liquid. Okay, so for many solids, but not all, solubility will increase as temperature increases. Okay, it's the exact opposite of what happens with the gas. So let's think about why the solubility of the sugar would increase as we increase the temperature. Well, it all has to do with the fact that when we're talking about sugar, what we actually have is essentially a crystal of sugar. So this might be representative of a crystal of sugar here. And this crystal of sugar contains lots and lots and lots of molecules of sugar. Okay, so the crystal is made up of many, 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 probably billions, trillions, many, 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 many sugar molecules. Now the idea here is that this is a solid, so those sugar molecules are packed in very, very tightly together. Okay, and as a result of that, they kind of are sticky toward one another. That's why a sugar crystal is a sugar crystal. Those sugar molecules are attracted to each other. One molecule is sticky toward another molecule, and that's what causes the formation of the crystal in the first place. Now here's the deal. If I take that sugar crystal and I put it into, for example, water or tea or whatever the case may be, what has to happen first? Well, we know that we have to break this crystal up, okay? We have to separate those sugar molecules from each other so that they can become part of the solution individually. That takes energy. So as a result, we have to absorb some energy to break up this crystal into its individual sugar molecules. Only then can the individual sugar molecules be surrounded by water molecules and solubilized. All right, so that's how solubility of a solid occurs. It takes energy to do that. Now, of course, we might get some of that energy back when the water molecules surround those individual sugar molecules, and there are going to be some attractions between water molecules and sugar molecules. So we're going to get some of that energy back, but the main issue is we need some energy up front to break up the crystal in the first place. 
Okay, so that's our explanation as to why um, solubility of a solid generally increases with increase in temperature. Now, let's think about a gas. Now, if we're dealing with a gas, remember, come back to our headspace here. What do we know about these molecules of carbon dioxide? Well, we know that they're far apart from each other and they're moving freely, right? So ultimately what this means is that we don't have to put energy into the gas to move the molecules far apart. They're already disassociated from each other. So we don't have to worry about that part. There's no energy that has to go into the system to break up a crystal, all right? So basically we're free. So now what we have to think about is what happens when one of those molecules ends up in the liquid. Now remember, we said that we can have positive interactions or attractions between water molecules and other things that are soluble. For example, carbon dioxide molecules. Now, as it turns out, these interactions between water molecules and carbon dioxide molecules are pretty weak. All right. So this sort of lends us to our understanding of why the solubility of a gas in a liquid um, would be more favorable at low temperatures. So let's think about this situation. So we have a solubilized CO2 molecule in our liquid here. And again, it's free to move throughout the liquid. Now the deal is, is this molecule can move back up to the interface here. And when it reaches the interface at higher temperatures, it's gonna have more energy. And if it has more energy, the chance of this thing overcoming the attractions that it has with the modern molecules and then escaping back out into the headspace is going to be greater. So what that tells me is that a gas should be less soluble at higher temperatures because it has more energy associated with it due to those high temperatures to escape from the water and move back into the gaseous phase. Now conversely, if we decrease the temperature, the solubilized carbon dioxide molecules are going to have less energy associated with them. So that means two things. There's less of a likelihood that they're going to reach the interface. And even if they do reach the interface, they're going to have less energy to be able to escape from the liquid phase and back into the vapor phase. So that's a simple model to explain now why a gas will be more soluble at a lower temperature than a higher temperature. So finally, we'd like to talk just a little bit about several um, common methods of carbonation that can be used either for home brewing or in the kombucha industry. So first off, if you're a small production home brewer, one very easy way to get good carbonation in your kombucha is to use what we call bottle conditioning. So this is where we might use something such as a flip top or snap top bottle such as this. So you can see that the um, top comes off, but then we can also put the top back on and seal it down well to get really almost a vacuum lock here. So the idea here is that we would um, fill our um, bottle up to about the neck with our kombucha prior to the um, secondary fermentation. And then what we can add is a little bit of fruit or something like that that would be part of the secondary fermentation and then allow that secondary fermentation to occur over maybe two or three days, typically at room temperature inside of the bottle. So what happens here is that the fermentation process will continue and of course one of the byproducts of fermentation is carbon dioxide. So the CO2 of course will be formed inside of the kombucha and then some of it will escape into the headspace to create a positive pressure there. So eventually we'll end up with an equilibrium of carbon dioxide between the headspace and the kombucha in the bottle. Now it's advisable from time to time, especially if we use um, something sugary like a fruit, to um, occasionally burp the bottle. So that means just letting off on the um, seal just a little bit to allow some of the excess carbon dioxide to escape from time to time. Generally a good idea because from time to time, we could then open up the bottle at the end of the secondary fermentation and get typically a kombucha volcano, which we'd like to avoid. Now, that's bottle conditioning. It's a very good option for a small scale brewer again, or a home brewer. Now, if we want to scale up a little bit, and this is what I personally do, I prefer to use a keg. So this is essentially the equivalent keg to what we just had on the board here just a little bit ago. It's got an inlet valve and an outlet valve here and a way to introduce the kombucha through the top. And essentially all we do here is we leave a head space. So we make sure, for example, if this is a two and a half gallon keg, I'll typically put about two gallons of kombucha in this, leave about a half a gallon of head space. 
Um, then what we do is we take, for example, a bottle of compressed carbon dioxide and we can then place that on the inlet valve here and apply whatever pressure we want through a regulator. And typically I would do this at refrigeration temperature and I would allow the kombucha to sit for a day or two um, to get maximum carbonation. So those are two very easy, simple, and common ways to get carbonation. So we hope you've enjoyed this video and we invite you back for our next one. Hope to see you again soon.